Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 1, continuing to verse 18. And after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I shall tell you. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place at which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offering shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Here ends our first reading. Our second lesson this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The letter to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. 
If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Here ends our second reading. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the 8th chapter of John, beginning at the 31st verse. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Here ends the reading. Let us pray before the proclamation of God's word this day. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, your word would go forth this morning with clarity and with purpose. Lord, we pray for its joyful reception in each person who is listening today, for those in this assembly right now, and for those who will tune in throughout the week. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would convict us of our sin, that we would realize our need for repentance. And Heavenly Father, that we would rejoice in finding our true hope in you. So help to illuminate those truths for us this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's sermon title is Freedom and Captivity in the Cross. And these have been the themes of our music this morning. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Now, in today's interaction, there is something different in the participants involved and who is having this dialogue back and forth. Normally, when we read about these encounters in Scripture, it's a go between Christ as one part of the conversation and the religious leaders, men like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
But here today we have a different type of scenario. We read about people in this conversation today who were faithful Jews, believing Jews who had liked and had loved to hear what Christ was proclaiming. But they were only beginners. And so we still hear the confusion in their questions. We begin to hear what the people did not understand because they were experiencing difficulty wrapping their minds around the truths that Jesus was imparting to them. Jesus was beginning to show his divine origin. As we read in the 42nd verse, For I came from God, Jesus said, and I am here. Now those who had just listened to Jesus were struggling to understand the implications of Christ's relationship to his heavenly Father. He was just beginning to communicate to them not only his celestial origin, but his pre-existence to Abraham. If we were to keep reading this gospel lesson, if we would have made it all the way to verse 48, then we would have heard Jesus' important statement that he spoke. Before Abraham was, I am. But the confusion of the believers soon changed when Jesus revealed to them that he not only predates Abraham, Jesus even predates the giving of the law. That in fact, Jesus even predates the law that is written on each one of our hearts because our Lord was present at the creation, that the creation was created through him. So it's understandable then that those who welcome the Lord's teaching still experience difficulty in comprehending Jesus existing from eternity. But as we heard in our assigned lesson this morning, these faithful Jews following Christ did not understand that the blessing that had been given to Abraham also came alongside with it a curse. Now we read in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 12 that when the Lord called Abram, that God promised Abraham that he would deliver three blessings to him. That he promised his descendants that they would have land. He promised his descendants that they would be a great nation. And he promised that Israel would be a blessing to the entire world. And the realization of Israel being a blessing to planet Earth all comes to its ultimate realization in the incarnation of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And we heard that same repetition in our Old Testament lesson today, did we not? That as Abraham was so faithful in, in being willing to sacrifice his own son, that we read the promises there again that you will be a great nation. You will have as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the sands along the seashore. Israel was indeed a blessing to the world, especially in bringing forth the person of Jesus Christ. But alongside that blessing, there always existed a curse. And we read in Exodus chapter 20 how the law was delivered and how the people did not obey the law. We read in Exodus chapter 20 that Moses received the Ten Commandments. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 5 about Moses receiving commandments at Mount Horeb. And then there's this third mountain that's also mentioned in the Old Testament in the first five books of the Bible, in particular, that there's this other giving of a type of law. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, we read that Moses gave instructions at a place called Mount Ebal, that before the Israelites were going to cross over out of the wilderness through the Jordan into Canaan, that Moses gave them instructions that these laws of God should be posted in public for all to remember and see. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, then, it's, an interesting, it's interesting to read how these laws are presented. In some ways, they sound a lot like the Ten Commandments, but in other ways, they have a little bit different feel and flavor to them. And one way in which these laws sound different than the Decalogue, that is, the Ten Commandments, is that these laws dictated at Mount Ebal begin with a curse. Cursed are those, fill in the blank. For example, cursed be the man who makes a carved or a cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made with the hands of craftsmen and sets it up in secret. God chose Israel and worked through Abraham and in the giving of the law through Moses. But the children of Israel, as you remember the narrative so well, did not 
keep that law frequently, but instead often turned to other gods to worship and to serve. Therefore, the nation of Israel took this curse upon itself in the same manner that this curse had existed in the world all throughout time from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, from the fall. Now, fortunately for Israel and for planet Earth in general, the blessing of the progeny of Abraham came to this world to break this wretched curse. And the one who broke this curse is the one who took that curse upon himself. Even before the warnings of these curses on Mount Ebal, earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 21, we read this interesting statement. Cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. And the Apostle Paul picked up on this, and he quotes this in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, the curse of sin has been broken for you. All who look to him for liberty for your souls are freed. You are free from the judgment of your sin because of the cross. And while the curse was broken on Calvary, even if you had never read the Bible or had never heard a sermon in your entire life, you still are quite aware from your own experience how the power of sin is so enslaving. As a human being, you constantly have to fight against temptation. It entices you. And by temptations, of course, I'm not speaking only of the lure of fattening foods and, the, and acting on impure thoughts. Christians also struggle in many other ways. You want to be in control. You want to be the master of your own destiny. You want to be the Lord of your own life. You want to hold on to all your possessions and all your finances for yourself. You don't want to be told what to do. This bondage to sin often produces pride and hard feelings, and it often creates negativity amongst even fellow believers. Relationships between friends and family can become strained. But sometimes our proclivity towards our trespasses even can lead to our own death. The coveting of one's possessions drives a person to steal or to be thrown in jail or to work oneself to a heart attack for the allure of the almighty dollar. If you are a Christian, you know that these kind of temptations and struggles do not go away once you believe in Jesus Christ, once you confess him as true man and true God. And these temptations are always present. The life of a Christian is always engaged in spiritual warfare. The battle of faith is to reject those things, to that, that those things that pull you away from your Lord. And because of your fallen nature, you are acutely aware of how difficult it is for God to be God in your life. And consequently, you're forced to admit that you stumble and you fall. When you compare yourself to the Ten Commandments, you know that you have not been faithful to the demands of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, just like Israel was unfaithful. You are in no better state. You realize that you are an imperfect human being, and your only guarantee in this life is that you're going to die and to stand to be judged. All of this is your lot without faith in Jesus Christ. But praise be to God that Jesus came into this cursed world and came to take that curse upon himself. And he stands in the judgment in your place. He specifically proclaimed this. He told the world this is what he came to do. When Jesus began his public ministry, as I've mentioned so many times, how did he announce his start? He said that he is come to preach the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. And eventually, when they started to push back on him, how did he answer their questions? But he said, he is the fulfillment of the law. 
when they accused him of being unfaithful to the law of Abraham and Moses. Jesus Christ takes the curse of sin upon the cross. And in faith, he gives you what he so freely wants to bestow to you. As you've heard me mention so many times as well, that he gives you his righteousness, his innocence, and his blessedness, as Luther's small catechism reminds us. For God's people, then the cross is liberation from judgment for your sins. Now, most of the time when you hear the word cross, you don't think of liberation, especially if you do not know the gospel story. You probably would think of it as being punishment, and indeed it was. But Jesus took the thing that this world tried to place upon him in punishment, and he has made it the most wonderful thing that has ever come about in this world. And praise God that he was willing to stand in your place. We hear these beautiful words from the scriptures, so reassuring to come across over and over again. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And therefore, as a Christian then, yes, you are still feeling the effects of sin. Yes, you are still trying to battle all those things which would pull you away from Christ. But you are no longer a slave, as Jesus points out in our gospel reading for today, that the slave has no place in the master's house. But we indeed do have a place in God's kingdom. Because Christ gives you his forgiveness. He gives you his pardon. So this is the greatest thing that we have as the people of God. That we have his forgiveness. That he has broken the curse of sin. But there are other blessings as well that God has gifted those who believe in him. And one of these other blessings that we have as the people of God, and particularly as Gentiles, is that we are no longer bound to keep the ceremonial law. In the Old Testament, the Jews were given laws about and regulations that reminded them who they were as a particular people of God. And God made a covenant with Abraham, and the sign of this covenant, as you know, was circumcision. And to this rule, many more regulations were added, and certain laws about kosher dietary restrictions came about. And the number of steps you could even take in the day on the Sabbath was regulated. The Pharisees had come up with so many rules and regulations to keep the original rules that there were 612 ordinances that needed to be observed in order to be considered following God. But we no longer are obliged to follow those laws. Why? Because once again, Jesus has fulfilled the law for you. He knows that you're incapable of keeping the moral law, and he certainly knows that you would be incapable of meeting the demands of the ceremonial law, too. We are people who have been called to freedom, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in so many places. But so often, we would take our liberty and create a new law out of it. Why would we want to go back to a yoke of slavery when Christ has set you free? But we do. And we find many creative ways of trying to invent new ways of following God. But this is not what Christ has called us to do. He calls us to a life of freedom in the gospel and not a new set of requirements not a higher law, not an ability to sort of do the law with a little more precision than the Jews in the Old Testament. Freedom in Christ is not a have-to kind of life, but it is a get-to kind of life. Freedom is not freedom from the judgment of sin only, but it's a freedom for peace with God and with your neighbor. For freedom Christ has set us free, the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 5. Therefore do not submit yourselves again to a yoke of slavery. This is what motivates you to do the things that you do for the people of God. You're not checking off a list. 
but you're doing ministry, you're engaging in service from your cup running over. It's a liberty that Jesus bestows. And then the Ten Commandments begin to change in your mind, your attitude towards them. It's not having to fulfill all its requirements, and it's, you don't see them as ten rules that are ruining your fun in your life by having to avoid this and stay away from that. But instead, it's an opportunity to serve. You begin to see the divine law that was given at Sinai and Horeb as ten safeguards for you that were established for your own good. In the cross, then, we rejoice in the fact that we get to keep the Ten Commandments. It's a privilege to be able to live as God has called us to live. The joy of the Lord becomes your strength. And as you grow in Christ and as you mature in faith, you find your identity as a joyful servant, not as some type of forced identity placed upon you against your will, but it is an opportunity to do what God would have you do. Martin Luther very clearly communicated this great truth of the scriptures. And he wrote a pamphlet titled On the Freedom of the Christian. And he began on the freedom of the Christian with this statement. A Christian is a free Lord, subject to none. A Christian is also a perfectly dutiful servant, subject to all. I'll repeat that. A Christian is a free Lord, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant, subject to all. See, in Christ, you are not only free from the condemnation of the law, but you are also empowered. You are equipped for joyful service, to use yourself to willingly yield your life to do the things that God wants you to do and you rejoice in getting to do them. You see them as opportunities for service. A good example to demonstrate the freedom of the cross is to place two circles at the intersection of the horizontal and vertical beams of the cross. And perhaps you've seen that before. It is styled frequently as a symbol for holy matrimony, a cross with two circles on it. Now many people, and we joke about this in our conversations, we talk about marriage as being a form of slavery. And friends and family plan a bachelor or bachelorette party to celebrate one last night of freedom. And just like being a Christian, sometimes marriage can feel like it is having to do for the other, having to obey the desires or fulfill the, the demands of the other. But most of the time, at least in our culture anyway, that people are not forced into marriage. And it's something that a man and a woman freely and consensually enter into. Why do husband and wife speak vows to one another? Because marriage is something better than the single estate. It's the combining of two into one. It's a deeper commitment, and it's more meaningful, and it expresses true love and devotion towards one another that can't exist outside of that covenant. Now, the institution of marriage can demonstrate for us then what Christian freedom is truly like. Just as husband and wife promise to love one another and serve one another, in the Christian faith then there is a clarification of callings. It is an acknowledgement of the role of each entity. And the Christian life then is claiming your identity as a needy child in need of your Heavenly Father's protection and loving care. See, God promises that he is truly your father, just as a husband and wife make promises to one another. In a much greater and much grander way, God makes promises to you too. And he promises that he will be with you, not till death do us part, but for all of eternity. He promises that he will be with your father through all of existence. The true freedom then finds itself in submission to Christ, just as husband and wife, as the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians, submit to one another. And that's why the Apostle Paul uses this analogy that it speaks so well, that it, it speaks to the human condition in that sense, that just as marriage can bring out the absolute worst in each one of us, and sometimes it ends so sadly, but it, that Christ can take that which has been soiled and has been broken and has been uh, defiled, and he takes us from that 
wretched estate and makes us of something so much better in his gospel. And so we rejoice once again in thinking of how our Lord and reminding ourselves of how our Lord has taken us to be his own and we are his servants and we call him our master and that he orders and dictates our lives. But at the same time, too, what a wonderful thing that that is, that we have him as the one who protects us and that we want to do what he says when we are in faith. In, in, in sin, we pull apart and want to follow our own agenda, as you all experience each and every day. But he has committed himself to you. And so I close today by repeating the words of that, the second hymn that we sang this morning. I'm going to read the words again. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquered be. I sink in life's alarm when by myself I stand. Imprison me within your arms, and strong shall be my hand. Let's pray about that today. Heavenly Father, we come to this reading today, a profound truth, thinking of a different context than, than so often Jesus encountered with those who were communication partners with him. And Lord, we think of these Jews today who were open and were glad to hear what you had to, your son had to communicate to them. But Lord, that they were confused, not understanding what does it mean that, that uh, Jesus uh, is greater than Abraham. And Lord, we can see that truth work its way all throughout Scripture as we think of the revelation of the commandments and how they bound the people to you, that you chose them, and they said that they would follow you. But Lord, how at the same time that it was showed their utter helplessness. And Lord, we can place ourselves right into that same circumstance, that you have promised us to be your God, and yet so frequently we would want to go on on our own and create images and idols of our own making. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that in spite of our rebellion, that you are true to your word and your claim upon us. And Lord, that we think about that relationship so strongly and how important it is that we would even describe it as you being our master and we are your servants. And Lord, to the world and to the, the worldly perspective, that sounds like servitude and slavery and, and bondage. But Heavenly Father, we realize it's a, it's a blessed service and that it's a wonderful thing to call you Lord and Master. So help us, Lord, to remember the relationship as it truly is. Not that we would try to define it with our human limitations, but Heavenly Father, that we would simply rejoice to be called as one of your own. So empower our service. Help us, Lord, to set our sinful agendas and natures aside so that we could follow you and be faithful to you all of our days. And we thank you, Lord, that your commitment and your vow to us is not something that ends at the grave. But, Lord, that it's only the beginning of calling you Master and Lord when we shall worship you in, in heaven above. We thank you, Lord, for your most wonderful claim upon us as your beloved servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.